Up next on Triangulation, I sit down with Brianna Wu and we cover a lot of ground. That's up next on Triangulation. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Triangulation, episode 397, recorded Friday, May 10th, 2019. Brianna Wu. This episode of Triangulation is brought to you by Captera. Find the right tools to make an informed software decision for your business. Captera is software selection simplified. Visit Captera's free website at captera.com slash triangulation. We have a survey for you that focuses on how you use collaborative software at work. It's brief, it takes about six minutes, and does not collect any personal data. Please go to twit.to slash survey14 right now. Thank you. Hello and welcome to Triangulation. This is the show where we sit down with people who are intimately involved in the world of technology, the things that you and I are so passionate about. I'm Jason Howell. I love doing this show. I get to talk with amazing people each time I'm on, and this time is obviously no different. Welcoming to the show, Brianna Wu, uh, and <laughs> kind of talking about who you are and what you've done <laughs> Like it's kind of all over the place. You're you're a podcast host of Rocket, a five by five podcast, of course. We are podcasters, so that's near and dear to my heart. Head of development at Giant Space Cat, so gaming yep. uh, development house, and then of course in in recent in the last few years, and now Democratic candidate for the U.S. Congress uh, in Massachusetts Eighth District. Welcome to the show, that's Brianna. It. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. <laughs> Absolutely, it's great to get you on. And uh, man, you're you're. Your life right now must be really exciting in a way that maybe five or even 10 years ago, you never imagined you would be in the position that you're in right now running for Congress. Uh, you know, it's when you are a coder, you don't go into this to like be a very public person. Like I'm happiest in days where I just get to be in my office, like experimenting with the new API. So yeah. Uh, you know, running for office, it's really required me to develop new parts of my personality. Uh, before the show started, I was telling you about call time, where you, you get a list of uh, hundreds of people to call every single day, and you just go through it. It's hundreds of new conversations. So, yeah, it's it's definitely a switch, but uh, I really see it as duty to this country. Uh, I think we have a lot of political problems right now. And we need people to understand technology setting policy. So, you know, our next election doesn't have hostile foreign nations coming in and influencing it. And when you're coming from your background, which we'll absolutely talk about all this stuff in, in more detail, but when you're coming from a, let's say, a gaming background, and then sure. now your life is so involved in the political side of, of this nation, like <laughs> those are two very, very different not not opposing forces, but they're definitely opposite ends of the spectrum. Are you still able to to kind of keep keep your hands involved in in the the gaming side of things? I mean, doing I a wish. couple of hundred calls a day. That honestly, to me, that sounds like you don't have time for anything else. Like I don't know how you, you do don't. a couple hundred calls in a single day, but you don't. You don't. Uh, I would love to tell you that I could play a lot of video games. I don't. <laughs> um, but I I think it's worth going further back in my career. Uh, you know I. I think I have a very unique background. Uh, I was adopted into a family in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, uh, when I was a very young child. And my family was very, very political growing up. Uh, so, you know, I spent a lot of time. I did my first startup uh, in 19 for a quarter million dollars. Uh, and then I actually, uh, when I was 19, I packed everything into my car and I drove off to D.C. to get a job in politics. Uh, it just wasn't something I liked at that time, but it's something I'm returning to now at 41. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you probably wouldn't have known then that it was setting the stage for something, you know, further down the line. Did your did your parents foster like uh, 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 your interest in technology? Where did that come from? Did, did your passion for technology? So this is uh, I, I think this is interesting. I'd love to get your take on this as a parent. Um I had a really interesting childhood in the sense that uh, Mississippi is the poorest state in America. And my father grew up in this really small town called Delo, Mississippi. 
and it had more deaths per capita than any other town due to World War II. So if you go to Delo, Mississippi today, it's just hollowed out. There are dead buildings everywhere. There's no economy. Uh, it's a lot of older, like, widows, frankly, uh, that go to church and kind of live in this small southern town. Uh, my dad saw that growing up and saw that he wasn't going to have a great life for himself. Uh, so he joined the Navy. He got his medical degree and he started up a women's health care clinic in uh, Hattiesburg in the late 80s. Uh, he was very successful at that. So I came from a very privileged background in the poorest state in America. So what that looked like for me is, you know, I would go talk to relatives and it would be in a trailer park and, you know, we'd be out shooting guns in 22s. And then I come home and my mom would be like building an 8088 to help my dad with his uh, clinic as it was starting out. And something my parents did that has really stood me in good stead through my career is anything I ever wanted to learn they gave me the resources to learn it. A really good story with this. Uh, when I was growing up, the driving age in Mississippi, it was only 14 years old and I wanted a car. And uh, my parents wouldn't pay to fix up a car, but they would give me all the money and the parts to fix it myself. Love so mm -hmm. um, I developed kind of an aptitude for technology and mechanical engineering at a very young age. So. Uh, that was something I carried through, whether it was, you know, if you want a computer, go build it yourself. If you want to learn, uh, if you want a stereo in your car, go install it yourself. And there was a, it was a, an approach that's been very helpful to me throughout my career. And this was part partially also kind of where your entrepreneurial spirit comes from, right? Like I think Absolutely. I read that, you know, when it comes to uh, working on cars and computer modification, like this was kind of your business, uh, if you want to call it that, through <laughs> high school, right? Yeah. Uh, when I was, oh gosh, you know, when I was a teenager, uh, gosh, the statute of limitations has run out so I can tell you this story. <laughs> yes, um, <laughs> that's what I was hoping for. I when I was a teenager, uh, I would, um, you know, my very first thing I ever did is it was uh, helping people like put, you know, add CD players to their cars. And that eventually uh, exploded out. Uh, one of my very first businesses, and this is not a legal business, was uh, in the late 90s. I got a dye sublimation printer and we found a blockbuster that was going out of business. And I actually had a very profitable business uh, making fake IDs for people in my grade. <laughs> so uh, yeah, we uh, that was actually why I learned Photoshop originally, believe it or not. Oh, uh, wow. Um, <laughs> ama amazing that you could that you could pull that off. And hey, yeah. obviously you're, you're really good at it. Because I mean, if you're making, if you're doing multiples of these, you only get yeah. better, right? Every time you do it. So. Right. It's, yeah. That's, that's what I've heard about making fake IDs anyways. I yes, know that I, can, I can testify for that, unfortunately. Uh, <laughs> another thing I read, and I thought this was very interesting. So, um, you know, I had a PlayStation when I was younger. Your parents bought you a PlayStation, but they didn't just buy you a PlayStation. They bought you one of the developing prototype versions of the PlayStation, which I remembered only after reading this, that that existed. How did they know to do that? Like, how did they know that that was the right device to buy for you? Oh, they didn't know any of that. Uh, basically, I came to my parents. I was like, look, my birthday is coming up. Uh, I would like to understand 3D development more. Uh, this is the way our industry is going. Uh, can I, will you help me buy this very expensive thing for my birthday? And they did. Uh, my parents, you know, they're not on the same political page as I am. And, you know, it's, it's interesting as you get older, you see both the flaws of your parents more clearly, but also the things that they did well. And sure. something I could never fault them for is uh, they, they always believed in me. And it certainly served me very well through my career. Were you able to use that system and, and create some cool things? I mean, it, it really did, seems yeah. like that was the the beginning points for, uh, you know, all of your, your game development um, history now in recent years. Absolutely. Uh, you know, uh, <laughs> I remember getting a copy of Ray Dreamweaver back mm -hmm. when, gosh, it was the 90s and you're running on a Macintosh G3, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> there was, uh, and this is really, this is, this is getting just a little bit political, but um, what really upsets me 
is now in 2019, I always assume that the lack of access I had as a child to computer science, it was because I grew up in the poor state in America and there just weren't like ways to learn computer science back then. It hurts me to be a political candidate today and to go to our schools and to see just how bereft our computer science education is in a state like Massachusetts. Like we're supposed to be the state of education. And you know, if you're in the richest areas of Boston, sure. But if you get south of the city, uh, it's just not the same situation. We've got to fix that. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um... I mean, and, and now now more than ever, technology is not just a luxury. Maybe back in the 80s, you could you could make that claim that like, oh, a technology in the classroom, you know, giving giving kids exposure to that technology seemed, I, I would imagine, then more like a luxury. Now it's really just a necessity. And we're seeing more of this in, in classrooms. And that's a that's a great thing. But I mean, really, the future is driven by technology. I mean, the present is driven by technology, not having that access, that ability at a young age that that just that that cuts off access to so many opportunities. Yeah, absolutely. I don't know if I believe that every child in America should learn to code, but I do firmly believe every child in America that wants to learn to code, that wants to learn video editing, that wants to learn sound design, you know, we should have classrooms in the 21st century that allow them to learn these things. Mm -hmm. And it just, it just really shocks me how that's not the case. It just seems obvious. Yeah, absolutely. What now, as far as your educational path, like speaking speaking <laughs> of education, like what what exactly drew you to political science? What drew you to kind of journalism? I mean, I feel like your 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 history is is dotted with all of these things, and ultimately, you know, they are the culmination of where you are now. But yeah. you've done so many different things. Political science and journalism is is a, a part of what you know the direction that you took when you were going to school. What, what was where was the draw there? Uh, there, the reason I originally uh, pursued political science as a minor is there was a girl I had a huge crush on, and she was taking a class called Political Science 99, <laughs> and that's why I took that class Sometimes originally. It's all it so, takes. you know, uh, just being honest here, uh, you know. Uh, then we came back, and I went to, um, yeah, I had the very much the the startup drop out of college path. Yeah. Um, you know, I was trying to run a business, my very first startup. Um, then I came back and uh, worked to finish up that degree later. I was like, oh, I'm like 90% through a political yeah. science degree. So. Yeah, you had no idea. You should yeah. thank her. You know, yeah, find, thank find you, her. Monica. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you also dabbled in animation during college. Uh, yeah. Can that be found online? Is that somewhere out there that somebody can be oh like, oh my oh. gosh, I hope not. It was when <laughs> After Effects 1.0 came out. Oh, I'm sure it's we amazing. Were one of the Oh, it was terrible, but we were one of the very first people to to work with After Effects. So when you see uh, the modern style, that's not like drawing an entire cell all at once. You just see uh, like a head or an arm interpolated between yeah. keyframes. Uh, we were very much on the forefront of that. I'm very proud of that. Yeah, I mean, hey, take a look at early, uh, well, early, uh, take a look at South Park anytime. Like, it's pretty <laughs> rudimentary what you could do Absolutely. with those very basic frames. Uh, this yeah. is the, uh, what was the the pilot that you created? Like, was there any sort of like like theme around it or story storyline or anything like that? You know, I would. It was. Uh, it was basically a college uh, comic strip that I did way back then. It was terrible. I'm sure I'd be embarrassed about it now. <laughs> but what what I'm proud of is. Throughout my career, I've seen something and I've never been afraid to jump in and learn things as I go. Uh, you know, with my um, with my very first podcast, which was uh, Isometric, um, you know, I'd never done a podcast before and I kind of had a plan mapped out to go meet Dan Benjamin mm -hmm. and make sure he got a copy of the pilot and to know the key figures in that field. And, you know, we just got out there, we made it happen. And it's just been a, a part of my personality that I, I'm very proud of, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, um, the iPhone comes around, so, you know, yeah. kind of reading up on things, the iPhone comes around and this was a point, you know, at this point you've, you've been involved in political fundraising, you've been a journalist, yeah. uh, and now the, now here's the iPhone and you see an opportunity, 
uh, to possibly develop uh, develop games for the iPhone. Uh, had you cons- yep. had you considered starting your own company at this point, or or was this just really like, hey, let's I've got an idea, let's see what we can do with this. So, uh, yeah, just to back up a bit, I yeah. had uh, gotten married. Uh, you know, I'm a bisexual woman, so I'd had boyfriends and girlfriends. And, you know, I got uh, married in, gosh, what year was that? 2008. And uh, my husband, he got a job in Boston, so we found ourselves here. And I was really looking for meaning in what I was going to be doing uh, next. I certainly didn't just want to be my husband's wife, right? Wow. Uh, and I had been upset. Since 1985, about the lack of women that got to be the heroes in video games. I mean, really think back to those early NES games Mm -hmm. and think about how many women you got to play in for those games. Something I think is so important. Super Mario 2 came out in the United States, I believe that was 1987. And I really, this is a game where you can finally play as a woman as the protagonist. And I was like, finally, the video game under, industry understands this. We're not going to make this mistake anymore going forward. And of course, it was, you know, 20 years before there would be another main series Mario game where you could play as Princess Peach. Uh, so I had been upset about this for literally 30 years. <laughs> so uh, I said to myself, you know, when you complain about this in gamer circles, you're like, why are why don't women ever get to be the heroes? Uh, they're like, well, if you don't like that, go make your own game. So I did. <laughs> Fair enough. Touche. Take that. Um, Is this about the time that you created Revolution 60? Uh, It is. Yeah. yeah. Uh, So I saw the Unreal demo for uh, the original iPad. And I know if you look at this today, it's not uh, stunning to like play Epic Citadel. But you got to understand, this was iPad 1. Um, Apple did not have any kind of API for 3D. It was uh, just a sprite kit back there, if I'm remembering correctly. Uh, we didn't have scene kit. Uh, it was very, very rudimentary tools within uh, Apple's frameworks to do 3D. So Epic kind of came along and supplemented this with uh, with uh, releasing Epic Citadel and Infinity Blade. And I saw that and I'm like, I'm looking at the next 30 years of computing. Um, It's really interesting. Every single generation of uh, computing technology tends to last about 30 years. Uh, The mainframe era lasted about 30 years. The desktop PC era, that lasted about 30 years. And when I saw that on a smartphone, I was like, this is where the game industry is going to be moving towards. So, uh, you know, I raised money. We uh, made an MVP. I hired a bunch of uh, women to come work on my team, and we put out a game I am just tremendously proud of. Uh, It's not like this, you know, in-app purchase-laden POS game. This is a, it's a fully 3D, that's the first version you're looking at right there. Uh, There's a special edition that came out later. It's a a really fully animated uh, movie that's four hours long and you have 28 endings, if I remember correctly. Everything you're looking at right here, this was running on iPhone 4, Hmm. which was breathtaking at the time. Our characters, you can see their hair animating, you can see their mouths moving, you can see facial expressions. There is no game in history at this point that had invested as much in facial animation on the iPhone as we had. Yeah, that's really something to look at and uh, super impressive. I, I love it. And I also love that, uh, you know, of, of some of the stuff that I've kind of read, you said you, you said that the games industry wasn't making games, like you said, that, that women are passionate about. Yep. You wanted to kind of jump in there and do that. So maybe, and, and I think this this kind of describes, you know, the direction that, that your life whether whether you knew it was going to happen or not, you know, would suddenly kind of stumble into the the GamerGate stuff eventually. But what what kind of games were did exist at that point? What how were they missing the, the their women market when women were making uh, such a large percentage of the of the gaming market? 
Sure. Uh, so uh, I would say on consoles, if basically that market was not being seriously addressed. Um, on iPhone, it tended to be just Candy Crush. Um, so right. I know so many women that were really passionate about the Mass Effect trilogy like I was. So I very deliberately took two games. I took Heavy Rain. Uh, which is just a stunning game on PS3. I cannot recommend it enough. And we deliberately mix that formula with Mass Effect uh, and the choice of it. And what I wanted to do is I wanted to create a game where you could play all the way through it. And even if you were had never played a video game before, that you would be able to enjoy this story. I just feel so strongly that you should not have to be comfortable with a you know a PS4 controller with 16 buttons and dual joysticks in order to enjoy a story. I think that's a real false assumption. So um, we fought to we fought just every single day with the publishing people we are working with because we wanted to bring in. Uh, it, when you sign up for playtesting cohorts, you're deluged with uh, dudes in their 20s. And mm -hmm. I want to be clear, there's nothing wrong with being a dude in your 20s. We'll take your money. I'm proud that so many of you enjoyed our game. But that's not the only kind of gamer there is out there. And we fought very hard to make sure in our playtesting that women were coming in, older women were coming in, people that had never played a game before were coming in. And I think more than anything else, I'm very proud that we designed a game that was that accessible. Yeah, and um, and do do you feel like do you feel like times now versus I mean this was just what five five seven years ago right around there I'm trying yeah. to remember when the iPhone four was but I mean so you know technology time is compressed in strange ways and and extends out in 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 different ways but do you think that's that's changed a lot between now and you know and then I mean if this was a, a hard to come by games that were kind of made with women in mind. Are we still kind of locked in the mentality that that none of the, you know these games that are being created right now still aren't really tailoring to what women are actually looking for in games? Uh, so I got to be honest with you, this isn't something I would have said while I was running GSX full time. Um, I think Apple has really failed at leading this on the app store in the way that they should. And I think the venture capital community overall has really uh, failed to find to like basically fund ideas by women founders. Uh, the last stat I looked at is only 2% of things that get funded uh, in Silicon Valley, uh, you know, basically have a woman as CEO, mm -hmm. even though women tend to overperform. So what we quickly found was a, a structural inertia for both getting our game covered in press and also in having Apple take what we are doing seriously. Um, I think it's very notable, and I want to stress this. I love Apple. I respect Apple. But if you go to a keynote, uh, especially in the era we were working at with them, and say, hey, have any companies starring women ever gotten to star, uh, like basically talk at an Apple keynote? Like you'll see women developers for Adobe, but you know, when it comes to games, it's giant evil mega corporation or chair. And don't get me wrong, I love the stuff that they make, but I think it's a kind of unconscious bias that uh, just keeps like, it's almost like app camp for girls. Everybody likes the idea of you know, women coding, but when it comes to the, the reality of supporting women in coding careers, it's just not there. Yeah, yeah. Were you... Um were you surprised at the reception of the reaction of the of the game when it was released and you sold as many as you did early on and i mean i feel yeah. like i feel like the press was was pretty pretty positive on the on the outcome of the game and everything Absolutely. Were, were you surprised or did you did you know as you were working on it that you were making a hit well, I knew that we were doing something that uh, would be received favorably by the people that uh, we wanted to get one yeah. of the things though I will never this is just being honest. One of the things um, that really hurt me about the game industry is we'll talk about Gamergate in a bit, which was a, a very dark chapter of the game industry. And I quickly became known as the woman from Gamergate. 
And when we came up with the with basically a redone version of Rev 60 that wasn't constrained by the iPhone 4s, you know, lack of memory and limited 3D capabilities, we went back through and produced a game that was far more visually stunning. Uh, just a, a better game overall. I'm, I'm very, very proud of that. I couldn't get a single game entity to cover the special edition. And the special edition absolutely failed. And I remember talking to my friends in the press, and I'm like, why won't you take me seriously as a game developer? You sure covered the threats of my life. You were happy to write everyday updates about Brianna the victim. Why won't you cover my professional work? And um, it, it really hurt me, to be honest with you. Absolutely. That's and that's like an uphill climb, uh, uphill battle that's hard to climb. Almost the kind of thing that's like, at, at least from what from what you're saying, at that point the the story has been written, and beyond that, even if your passion is well, my passion is still making games, and you know, but that can never be the story. Apparently, the story will always be this legacy of GamerGate, which we will absolutely uh, talk about. Uh, whether whether you, you no one wants to be in that position, but you didn't have a cho you really didn't have a choice. You ended up in that position. We're gonna we're gonna talk about that. And uh, man, it's it's a crazy um, crazy story to get into. I, I I respect you so much for being so resilient through all of this because you really were up against uh, way more than anyone should be up against. Let's uh, let's take a break and then we'll come back and we'll talk a little bit about that and a whole lot more. This episode of Triangulation is brought to you by Capterra. Uh, finding software is complicated, but it does not have to be. Capterra puts thousands of real software reviews at your fingertips. They're the leading free online resource to help you find the best software solution for your business. Capterra actually has over 875,000 reviews of products with 30,000 fresh reviews available each month. So you can discover everything that you need uh, to make an informed decision. If you're looking for a specific type of software, this is a great way to do it because you're actually checking out reviews from other users who know this software just like you do or, or what the needs are of this particular type of software. So you can search more than 700 specific categories of software, CRM, IT project management, uh, e-commerce, link management tools, web conferencing. That's just to name a few. There are seven, more than 700 of these categories in there. So you can really find the one that's just perfect for you. Once you choose a category, you can filter results. Uh, you can filter by product rating, users, deployment, features, all that stuff so you can find the thing that's most important to you. And then you can compare them side by side up to four at a time. And that's going to show you, you know, as well, along with that, uh, a list of related categories so you can open up your options even further. Uh, it's just really really easy to kind of dive right in there, choose a category and uh, and search through it and see kind of where it takes you. Yoga studio management <laughs> is a one category of many. That's how kind of uh, detailed and specific it can get. No matter what kind of software your business needs, Capterra makes it easy to discover the right solution and fast. And once you find that perfect software, uh, remember to leave a review yourself. That way you're sharing your knowledge with other buyers because knowledge is power. And that's really the beauty of Capterra is the shared knowledge database of uh, you know who's using the software, what it's being used for, and what the best software is. Check out Capterra's free website. You can visit capterra.com slash triangulation and join the millions of people who've used Capterra to find the right tools for their business. Uh, that's capterra.com slash triangulation, C-A-P-T-E-R-R-A.com slash triangulation. Capterra is software selection simplified, and we thank them for their support of triangulation. So, okay, this is a obviously uncomfortable topic to dive into. This could go in a million different directions. I imagine at this point you're relatively comfortable talking about it, and that in and of itself is a sh is a shame because no one should have to to go through uh, what you've gone through with Gamergate. But before we kind of talk about your specific experience, I thought maybe we'd touch a little bit on what led to this this movement. Kind of what uh, you know, years ago, this this thing called Gamergate suddenly suddenly began and suddenly it was on everybody's radar. What do you see as the foundation um, of the ideology that that drove Gamergate to something that had such a, a big impact? That's a really good question. Um, I think the narrative that a lot of people have about Gamergate is it's a bunch of uh, 
just, you know, trolls living in their mom's basement or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think it's much more basic than that. Um, I think, and I say this as a lifelong gamer, uh, I love games. I'm passionate about our industry, but there's something deeply broken in gamer culture. And, you know, I, um, I play a game called Final Fantasy, uh, uh, Final Fantasy collectible card game. And I was on a message board yesterday as a congressional candidate, right? I'm still playing this game. And someone there is making a joke about the Holocaust. And I'm like, you know, I don't think the Holocaust is actually funny. And you just have this surge of people like, oh, how dare you censor free speech and, you know, all of those kinds of arguments. There's something fundamentally not empathetic about gamer culture. And I've asked myself for a long time where that comes from. And I think it's that for 30 years, our industry has picked a very specific kind of consumer and we've kind of made them the, the center of the universe. And we've made a lot of games about, you know, like I've probably killed millions of people in, you know, first person shooters. I've never played a game really about empathy or social skills. And I think it's led to a very toxic culture. Um, so I think that's kind of the 30,000 foot view of where this came from. Um, more directly, um, you know, by 2014, women were organizing and trying to get, you know, more recognition in our careers. Uh, a lot of people kind of see Zoe Quinn as the start of Gamergate. I disagree. I think uh, Anita Sarkeesian and Samantha Allen being targeted uh, was really the start of Gamergate. So uh, this was a woman that was a game journalist. She uh, tweeted something about Giant Bomb, yet again, not hiring women for a certain position. And she was harassed so badly, she actually ended up leaving the industry over it. That was what affected me enough to stand up to what I saw was happening. Right. Yeah. You weren't, you were not kind of involved in, in the kind of growing chaos that surrounded this Gamergate movement. This, I don't know if this was before Gamergate was actually a terminology at the time, uh, but your friends were, and that kind of pulled you into it. Um, and I, I know as a podcaster myself, I've had my own kind of fears, let's say, yeah. of saying something on a show, you know, it's a very public thing that we do as podcasters. And oftentimes we're, we're talking about how we feel and, and, and all that kind of stuff, but things can, things can come out and, and, and you know, occur, strike someone differently than what we intended, or maybe we're speaking from the heart and, you know, we're used to like keeping some things in because we don't want to rock the boat, but then it comes out and then, oh good, what are, what are the ramifications of actually opening my heart and being 100% authentic in this moment? Um, but this is kind of what you experienced, right? You you uh, were on a podcast and you talked openly about about this at the time. Uh, yeah. Did you have any idea in doing that kind of what what kind of series of events this might start off for you? Like in the moment, were you were you concerned about speaking so openly about this on a, on such a a public venue as a podcast? Well, I I, I think I would answer that question this way. Um, for me. Let me let me back up a bit and tell you a story about growing up in the Deep South. I, I will never forget this. Um, the stereotype about Southerners is sometimes upsets me because there are so many genuine, good-hearted, amazing people that I know in Mississippi. And I get angry about the stereotype sometimes. But the... The, the, the perception publicly that people have about racism can be very true. And I remember being eight years old at a Christmas dinner and we were having some relatives over and someone Jewish had moved onto our block and um, there were relatives at our house and they started saying the most stomach churning anti-Semitic stuff you could possibly imagine. And as an eight-year-old, I remember looking at all the adults here, smart, warm-hearted, caring people. And I remember asking myself, why isn't anyone speaking up about this? Mm -hmm. And at the time, I thought it was just something that was broken in the South. 
And as I got older, I learned that it's not. It's a dark part of human nature. Unfortunately, when our moment comes to kind of stand up and do the right thing, most people don't. And just for whatever reason, I'm built in a way where I couldn't feel good about the person I am if I did that. So for me, um, when this was happening to women in the field, including Samantha Allen, um, I found myself saying, and I had this conversation with my husband, if we sit down, if we're silent, if we just wait for this to blow over, am I going to feel good about myself next year, five years, 10 years from now? And the answer is no. And I talked to my husband. I said, if we keep speaking out against Gamergate, we will get death threats. This will affect both of our careers. Are you okay with this? And my husband had my back. He was there with me all the way. So there it is. Man, yeah, no, super, super powerful. And such a such a, a spot on realization of the power of the decision in the moment, right? To, yeah. to and I mean, pro, you know, props to you both for talking about this before before going into it because you know it is both of you <laughs> that exists within this world um so you know knowing that you have the support of your husband to go down this down this path and be exposed to what you were which is basically an, an avalanche um and i imagine to a certain degree that that continues to this day i hope that that's I, ho I hope that it, it does, you know it stops completely but i hope at least that it's it's trailed off a little bit how do you how do you, when you're in the midst of that avalanche and in the midst of that chaos, how do you stay, stay sane, stay within, you know, your, your, your right mind through that? Because I mean, it's very disillusioning to be stuck within that world of, of threats and, and all that. Well, I would say this, um, you can't go through getting, I just want to kind of give your viewers and listeners a little bit of background. Um, it wasn't that I got death threats from Gamergate. It's that the harassment and threats I go got were so serious, they based a Law & Order episode on it. Mm -hmm. um, it was really over the top. Um, people following me around uh, at PAX saying they were going to murder me and, and broadcasting it. Uh, in the Law & Order episode, there's a video of a man in a mask uh, that was based on a video that was sent to me of a guy that you know, put out this video of him holding a knife up to the camera and telling me, this is going to be the last thing you feel tonight, oh this going God. through your throat. Um, it was, it was. I mean, we got, uh, my college called me at one point. They're like, we want to let you know someone came here today impersonating you, trying to get your academic records. Um, my entire medical history, it was really, really intense harassment. Um, what I would say is you can't go through that and not have it deeply affect you. Absolutely. Um, and it, it did break me. Um, I spent much of 2014, 2015, and 2016 in therapy with a PTSD specialist. Um, this is something I've talked about openly. I don't even drink alcohol. I'm a complete teetotaler, but uh, eventually I was working with a PTSD specialist and she's like, you know, you need to look at a chemical aid to help you get through this because we're not going to get any further with talk therapy. Um, I went to, um, I got a medicinal marijuana license here in Massachusetts. I tried pot once. I had not liked it. Uh, but as far as PTSD, it was a miracle drug for me getting my life back together. Uh, what I would find is my hands would shake sometimes when I would have flashbacks about the death threats. And um, I would take CBD oil, which is, it doesn't get you high. It just calms your nervous system right. down. Right. And that helped me get to a point where uh, it just didn't even affect me anymore. It was just amazing. Would you say, you know, now now you're in a position of, of running for Congress, would you say that that experience informed your uh, your own policy for legalized marijuana and kind of the yeah. use of marijuana? Well, of course. I mean, um, <laughs> you know, it's interesting. If you spend a lot of time with the marijuana community, uh, they, they kind of... Um, 
Uh, I don't have any issue with someone that wants to take it for recreational purposes. It's not my thing. Um, I would probably advise someone that was underage to let your brain develop first before experimenting with this. I've certainly seen it affect people, but, you know, adults, we need to be able to make our own choices. And I can't see a reason why this should be criminalized in the United States. Yeah. And I mean, you know, um, props, props to you for getting help with PTSD. I know, especially with PTSD, you know, my dad has experienced PTSD from, from the war. And sometimes it's not always easy for someone in that position, at least through my experience with my dad, for them to realize that help it is okay. It's okay to, yeah. to reach out and get yeah. that help. I think sometimes there's, there's a, uh, there's shame of some sort attached to needing to reach out. Why, why do people feel shameful uh, for getting the help that they need when it comes to something like this from your well, perspective? Well, I think, I think as a society, we really stigmatize mental health issues and you know, mental health is just that it's health. Um, so it hurts me sometimes when I read about people with depression or PTSD or anxiety that aren't able to get the help that they need. Um, what, something I believe very strongly is in America, we're very quick to take a pill to solve a problem. And what I would encourage anyone out there struggling with this to do is it takes courage to go and get help. And, you know, therapy and therapists, they can really help you live your best life. Um, I've done a lot of things in my career, and I've certainly not done that alone. So um, I benefited from this. And anyone that's going to be on your side and have your best interests at heart, we're not going to judge you for this. We, we love you as you are, and we want to see you be the best version of yourself. So I think that's an important message. Absolutely. Uh, beautifully said. So um, have you found that it's gotten easier to, to now, you know, in a in few years at least removed from, from the height of this experience to talk about your, your Gamergate experience uh, at this no, point? No, I have to be honest. I'm trying to fight back tears right now. Yeah. It's hard to talk yeah. about. Um, but it's it's what I'm known for, and... You know, um, I made a choice to stand up and I, I do think that there's power in other people seeing that example of someone who is not going to sit down, someone that's going to fight for what she believes in. And that's yeah. a lot of why uh, I decided to run for Congress. What I learned during Gamergate is that when I stood up, I could make a difference. I could help people out. And, um, you know, if you feel if you belong to a different political party than I do, that's fine. We could still be friends. But uh, what I felt from the 2016 election is that I needed to stand up and do what I believed was right. Yeah. And that's exactly it. Right. Like this, uh, this unfortunate experience has helped to mold you and push you into a direction where you can affect change. And I think actually, you know, you, you never asked to be put into this position as far as the Gamergate stuff is concerned. But you were in some ways, I, I hate to use the term the, the right person, but your personality was the right personality to go into it because you had the strength to be resilient through it. And to, and you know what I mean? And to push back instead of instead of, you know, ending down and allowing it to kind of reduce you to a puddle. You were, yeah. you were able to stand up to that. And I think through that, that you end up acting as a symbol of strength, especially for other women and for girls who might feel, you know, might find themselves in a, in a somewhat similar position um, where their power is being taken away from them. And, yeah. uh, you know, that you act as a role model for that. So I, I know you didn't ask to be put there, but I know that I know that a lot of people look up to you for that. I I know they do. Uh, it's not really the way I see myself. Um, I kind of uh, there's a great line from uh, Robert A. Heinlein's "The Moon Is a Harsh Mistress," where Manny talks about how he saw himself as just doing what had to be done. That's always been the way I saw this. Um, I, I hope this isn't too personal to share, but. Uh, you know, when I was in my 20s, I finally got the strength to come out to my parents. And um, my greatest wish my entire life was that I would keep their love when I did. And I didn't. They disowned me instantly. I uh, never saw them again in person after that day. Mm. Uh, they withdrew help from me in college. And um, I found myself homeless not long after that. 
um, there was a Honda Accord that I had uh, that broke down years ago. And it sat in my husband and I's yard. And I could not sell it because I had lived in that car when I was homeless. And it was so terrifying to me to think about um, losing that thing that kept me alive. Yeah. Um, when you've gone through something like that, Gamergate didn't really scare me. It yeah, affected yeah. me, but it didn't scare me standing up for that. So um, I don't know. I feel like that experience, I try to look at it instead of a, why did this happen to me with anger? I try to look at it as this is the strength I got from surviving this experience. And wow, am I lucky because a lot of other people don't survive that. Absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, in a 2015 interview for Inc., uh, you said most people just don't believe in fighting for things greater than themselves. Most people are, are more self-interested. Uh, obviously, you do. You believe fighting for things that are greater than yourself. That's obvious because you decided uh, to run for Congress. So wh at what point did you make that decision? At what point were you like, you know what, I need to, I need to kind of uh, get in there in, in the political realm and start this new chapter of my life? Well, it was uh, the day after Donald Trump run, ran. And I, I know a lot of Donald Trump fans probably watch your show and twit. So I don't want to, you know, I don't want to alienate people that believe in that. It's not my belief. But the way I felt um, on election night was so strongly that I needed to run and bring my viewpoint to Congress. Even if uh, you and I don't belong to the same political party, I think anyone watching your show would agree that we desperately need better tech leadership in Washington. Um, it is, I hate to use this word, but it's beyond inept right now. It's embarrassing to the United States. Um, so I really felt called to stand up and do what I could to you know, stop things like hostile foreign nations uh, affecting our elections. There was a story that came out recently that Russia uh, penetrated 50 out of 50 states in this country and our election rolls there. Uh, so this is something that's very personal to me, and I felt uh, called to do what I could to turn that around. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and once again, you're putting yourself into a very vulnerable position, vulnerability in a highly public uh, position. How how was this different from what you had just encountered, you know, the previous couple of years? I mean, po politics, it, strangely, politics and Gamergate in some ways can be very similar, right? Like it's just the, the, the kind of energy behind the I'm right, you're wrong perspective uh, can be very similar. Um, how was this different? So this is a really insightful question, and I want to answer it in two parts. Um, the The first of it, I would say, is that I still get death threats to this day. Uh, I talked to the FBI just this week about a very, very serious threat. Um, it's just part of the job. But what I think is interesting is I didn't ask to be targeted by Gamergate, so when this happens in running for office, it doesn't affect me in the same way, if that makes sense. Um, I made a choice to run for office. I got the forms from the Secretary of State. I filed the paperwork with the FEC. I am making a choice to be here. And as a part of that, there's a certain amount of scrutiny that I signed up for. So just for whatever reason, um, it affects me in a different way. Like I feel like this is something I'm choosing to do, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So, um, and to a certain extent, like if somebody, I mean, I get called every name in the book every day and it's just like, this is my job, right? So, uh, but the second part of this, I would say, and this is, this is really getting real with you here. One of the biggest lessons I have learned in running for office is warrior Brianna Wu got me really far through my career. You know, warrior Brianna Wu, when I couldn't figure out a tech problem for my game studio and I needed to go to bat with Epic to get an API updated so our feature would work. That's something that served me very well. Uh, warrior Brianna, like talking about women's rights served me very well during Gamergate. What I've learned being a politician is warrior Brianna Wu doesn't work. And there are parts of myself 
that have really grown through this process, I think are some of the best parts of myself. Um, Every day you're out there and you're talking to people, they're completely unlike you. Maybe they're union workers on the electrical grid or they're people of color living in a, a school district that's just as underfunded as mine was growing up. And what I find is this job has leveled up my empathy mm-hmm. and my listening and my ability to like find parts of myself in other people, if that makes sense to you. And the thing I can't figure out about politics is why so many people that do this job end up being such terrible people, because I feel like it's made me a much better person, if that makes sense. Yeah, 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 I'm... Uh, that's a really great question because I can't imagine being exposed to, to the opportunity of talking and connecting and understanding stories, you know, that that cover the wide gamut of possibilities throughout the United States. Just as one example, you're right. That's like honing your your sense of of empathy, being being able to kind of learn through them, you know, make that eye contact and learn their stories and, and be able to kind of integrate that with yourself. It's hard to think of that numbing at some point, which is kind of where my mind goes when you explain that, that someone could enter into politics, maybe with the right frame of mind, but 20, 30, 40 years down the line, it's just that thing you do. And now, you know, these competing, these competing, you know, factors in your life, like your own success, begins to kind of overtake your perception of, of empathy around the people who you are actually, you know, employed to serve. Right. And, you know, it's, uh, I, maybe this is just me, but like, I didn't get involved in Gamergate to fight for myself. It was always about the way my colleagues were being treated. I think that was why I was particularly effective at what I did in that same way. Um, yeah, you know, when you talk to people and you're running for office, they tell you the most heartbreaking stories about trying to get health care. Um, I knew nothing about disability court before getting, you know, running for office. And you learn about these areas of policy that are fundamentally broken. And people tell you their stories and they are trusting you. Mm-hmm. They are trusting mm-hmm. you to do the right thing. And some of the most touching moments I've had in doing this, it's not, <coughs> you know, when someone makes a good living and they give you a max donation. I love that. And that's a huge sense of trust. But when a school teacher that has to basically use her own money to get pencils, when you're hearing her story about healthcare and she writes you a check for a hundred dollars, that is a huge amount of trust yeah. that she's putting in you, if that makes sense. Absolutely. So, um, so I guess I would say if I ever get to the point where I lose this part of myself, do me a favor and vote me out of office. <laughs> so I am absolutely not saying that you'd ever get there. And I'm not I saying that not. every politician does. Um, but it happens to a lot but of it happens them, to a lot. It? Yeah. yeah, it seems yeah. to anyways. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you said early on uh, that many women would run and lose in the election that, that just passed, uh, but that they should keep running because odds increase the next time that they run do you do you see the build up to that do you see that kind of happening right now is that what we're gearing up to uh to to see in our next election yeah so just to give your listeners a little bit of background i ran in 2018 uh i did amazingly well for a first-time candidate i got over 17,000 uh votes which is great for a small scrappy campaign filled with people that had not worked in politics before i'm very proud of that Mm -hmm. and uh but we lost uh and i'd always said that we were going to run twice uh i looked at it as an engineer before i started i was like the odds of a first-time candidate running for federal office and winning are less than four percent that's not good um but i knew that if you ran again your odds skyrocketed uh so i was always planning to run twice what i have found is so many women and even men that i know uh that ran for office and lost it was so heartbreaking for them that they just quit uh just really wonderful candidates are not running again and this is where i wonder if my background in the tech industry has been a good basis for politics because in the tech industry like if you 
write some code and it doesn't work like you expect that to happen mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. we love iteration it's not it's part of the job so i think that kind of resiliency has really helped me yeah not only that but in silicon valley you know that it's it's kind of uh part of part of the rule that they live by is you, you fail until you win you know what i mean right, right. <laughs> that's exactly. not a reason to stop and the people that actually you know in, in a lot of cases the people that actually make it uh incredibly far are the ones that have you know had a number of failures behind them but you learn through that and you grow through that i'm a much better candidate this time around uh the first thing i did when i lost on election night is uh, i did take that evening off with my husband and then uh we started interviewing people the next day uh, our interim campaign manager right now he has over 20 years of experience our finance director he's a great guy we have a digital team with decades of experience. Um, you know, the biggest lesson I learned is that on an engineering team, you can hire someone that's never worked in that field before and you can kind of learn a new API together. That doesn't work in politics because in two years, the election's already over. So yeah, yeah. you've got to hire people with experience. So yeah, that's what we did. So a lot to look forward to there. If people uh, want to contribute to the campaign, like how do they do that? Do they go to your, your site or what, what can they do to get involved? Thanks for asking that question. Absolutely. Uh, you can do that by going to Support Brianna. Uh, Support Brianna, that's our fundraising site. And if you want to learn more about my positions, uh, you know, please go to BriannaWooForCongress.com. There's a funny story about that website. Gamergate got that website before I could the first time around. Mm -hmm. And I just sat there refreshing the page uh, constantly on the day because they only did it for one year. And I managed to nab it up for this cycle. <laughs> <laughs> oh man and, and meanwhile yeah that's that's brilliant that you kept trying because you yep. know once again people see that that it's taken and they don't think to go back i've definitely yep. done that before i'm like dang i gotta get that <laughs> set myself a calendar reminder refresh refresh get it um so you've been so you've been on the inside of politics now and i think from the outside of politics looking in it's easy for just a you know everyday person like myself or people watching and listening to be somewhat disillusioned with what they see in politics uh but you've been on the inside obviously you plan to continue if you could uh single-handedly improve the way u.s politics work having that inside perspective is there one one thing that really stands out to you that you're like man this this needs improvement and maybe it's not obvious to people outside of the the scope so so jason you and i are about the same age right i'm yeah. 41 mm -hmm. yeah, so 40, 44 right. Okay, so people our age, we need to run for office. It's all our parents that are serving right now. Mm -hmm. So I think, um, I, I, I really mean this. People talk to me all the time. They're like, they're disillusioned. They're, they're frustrated. And I get it. The news is depressing every single freaking day. But what I see on the inside is I see so many people getting active running for office, supporting people that are running for office, getting involved. There are so many people I know that have never worked in an election before that are volunteering in my town to help count the ballots. And I think the one silver lining of the last few years in American politics has been, it's been a real wake up call for our generation, for millennials and for Gen Y, that if we sit it out, the worst people in the world are going to make the decisions for us. Mm -hmm. So it's hard, like running for office is kind of a terrible job, <laughs> but we've got to do this because if we don't, like this is not going to be a country that works for most of us. Yeah, absolutely. Um, before we before we kind of end end things, this has been super inspirational to me, and I really appreciate you being so open and candid. And I know some, as I was writing some of these questions, Carson, our producer, I, I asked him, I was like, "Is is Brianna going to be okay with me asking like some of these kind of more deeper, kind of heartfelt, you know, um, uh, vul vulnerable questions?" Um, so I hope I didn't over overstep those boundaries, but um, I think I, you know, from my perspective, I love I love knowing that I'm communicating with a human being 
that has you know that is in touch with with that vulnerability and uh that's kind of the story you know your your big story the past 10 years that you've connected with that vulnerability and it's you know unfortunately it's been in in view of of everyone but i really think that people have learned some really valuable lessons about themselves in experiencing this through your lens and obviously now with your position uh, you know as as you pursue a role in Congress that allows people to to be active and and also participate uh, to hopefully make make things better if if they feel this is the way to make things better this gives them a place to do that so thank you for um, for opening opening up to me today and to our listeners on the show appreciate it of course and yeah the last I'll say when you grow up queer in the south um, yeah, there's a line from V for Vendetta that makes me cry every single time I see it. And she's talking about that one little inch of yourself. It's so precious. Yeah. And it's so important and you have to cherish it. And I think anyone that I, I for me, being my authentic self, it came at such a high price. It cost me my parents. You know, it cost me my relatives. Uh, it cost me my safety. Um, and you know, I think just being honest with the people around you, I've tried it both ways, like, you know, not being honest with people and, you know, not honest, but being open with people right, right. and being open. And I just, I think that when you're unafraid about who you are and you're open and, you know, able to hear other people and interested in other people, I just think it's a path to the best parts of yourself. So... That's my opinion. <laughs> Absolutely. I completely agree, Brianna. Brianna Wu, uh, support Brianna.com, of course. And at Brianna Wu on Twitter, if people want to... Twitter. Follow follow your feeds. You're always putting out some really great uh, great stuff on Twitter, of course. Uh, Brianna, thank you again for joining us on Triangulation. It's been an honor uh, talking with you today. Feeling is mutual, Jason. <laughs> thank you. Very much. Thank you. Uh, we do this show every Friday. We did this one a little bit later than normal, but usually we record at uh, two thirty p.m. Eastern, eleven thirty a.m. Pacific. 1830 UTC. If you want to check it out live, you can twit.tv slash live, but uh, most people end up getting the podcast and you can go to our show page, twit.tv slash TRI for, or twit.tv slash triangulation. There you can find links to our audio, our video, uh, every single episode that we've done. This of course is, uh, you know, 396 episodes behind us. And then of course this one makes 397. Let's, let's just say we have a lot of interviews with a lot of amazing people like Brianna, uh, that you can catch up on if you have not done that already. Uh, big thanks to Karsten uh, for setting this up and uh, for helping me put today's show together. And thanks to you for watching. And uh, we'll see you next week on another episode of Triangulation. Take care, everybody.